Welcome back to another segment of Dermcast TV. Rob Cascao in the studio again with Ely Samuels, Injection Extraordinaire. Uh -huh. <laughs> Welcome back, Ely. And well, I'm happy to be here. You flatter me so much. I'm going to come every well, day. <laughs> hey, man, you know, I'm, that's what I'm here for, you know, uh, daily affirmation. But we're going to, speaking of affirmation, this is why we do cosmetics, right? So let's talk about fillers today okay. and try to come up with some practical things for our viewers. So when we're evaluating people for cosmetics, this can be a very detailed thing. Give us three bullets that you uh, like to use when evaluating for filler. Yeah, so they're going to be basically the same as I do for neurotoxins. I want them washing their face. I want, you know, a nice clean canvas, as I call it. Um, I'm going to want them to animate um, because I want to see how their face moves and be able to see like where filler would go. I think animation is really important with filler as well because if you're going to um, give somebody some extra volume in their mid face over here and when they smile naturally they get these really full balls if you add to that that's not going to look right so even though it's not a neurotoxin right and we're not talking about muscle movement we still need to you know assess muscle movement even for your filler patients and just make sure it's going to look right and has the face changes and moves that these products will fit for that patient and in the areas we want to treat them um, I think as well, I, we talked earlier about, about having them do a little bit of a tilt so we can view their asymmetries from side to side, rotating around the patient because they'll look different in different lighting right. and different angles. So as I'm talking to them and just learning about them and so, more of a social aspect, I'm evaluating them in my head. And so let me, I'm going to pick apart the, yeah. the oblique view of mm -hmm. the face. Uh, that uh, the concept there is that by looking at an oblique view, you can see the curvature of their cheeks. Exactly. You can see the OG loss of volume. Curves, right. Mm -hmm, okay. Everything. Great. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Very practical. And sometimes stuff. when you start doing that, you really see how like people are super asymmetrical. Mm -hmm. One cheek will be several millimeters higher than the other. Right. Um, and you might not realize that when you're looking at them head on. And once they tilt, I mean, my patients joke that I'm like, you know, a contortionist when I'm injecting them and when yeah. I'm evaluating them because I'm like going down, I'm going up, I'm going right. to the side, I'm like yeah. really going all over because I want to see them at every angle. Sure. And as I'm injecting, I'm reevaluating them. I'm mm -hmm. seeing what that 0.2 mLs just did. I'm reevaluating, going from side to side, seeing what, what that just did. Great, fantastic. Yeah. Now, so evaluation and then um, treatment. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a lot of stuff out there to mm -hmm. use. Um, and uh, I know that you've used all of these things. Yes. So where do you um, start sorting these things out? How do you go about product selection um, with your uh, patients? Yeah, so that's a really loaded question and there's so much that goes into that. But I think the good way to start is rheology. I think it's very un important for us as injectors to understand the rheolo rheological properties of our, of our tools. And once you understand how the gels work, how they were made, um, their, all their different scientific properties and, and the technology in and of itself, then you'll understand where to inject it on which patient to get what type of effect. So for example, if I'm doing, I want to use a hyaluronic acid filler that's more for structural support, stay where you put it, um, you know, in, more in the lateral, lateral cheeks and the lateral face, I want something with a high G prime. Mm -hmm. If I'm, you know, treating a jawline, I want something with a very high G prime that's just going to really stay where I put it. Um, versus if I'm, you know, injecting a lip, that would not work. I need something that's more flexible, um, something that's a very soft looking, will move with the face as they're talking. Very important things to think about as you're selecting your filler. Um, as well as just looking at the patient. Can they handle the rheological properties of this, um, of this product? So let's say you have a patient who is really volume depleted, you know, like a 75-year-old lady, skin on bone. To use a product that has a very high G-prime in their cheek, you might be able to see it. So right. I'm going to want something that has very high tissue integration, but also has a high G-prime. And understanding what G-prime means, what flexibility means, what cohesivity means, and which fillers have which, all come together when you're looking at your patient and how you, you choose what you're going to use. Okay, great. And so Is just that a for, lot? I'm sorry. That, no, that's, that's, that's <laughs> good. That's good. Just for the viewers, yeah. explain G-prime. Ah, uh, very okay. Yeah. Okay. So G-prime is um, a 
you know, a way that we describe a rheological property. And I actually saw this in person, which was really cool. Galderma um, sent me to Sweden, to Uppsala, Sweden, where they have their manufacturing plant of Restylin. And I got to watch them make Restylin oh, from cool. start to finish, from powder all the way to putting it in the, the package and putting it in the box. It was really cool. And it's a, an outstanding, um, wonderful thing to watch. Uh, but um, so one of the things that they do um, to test G prime, and I watch them do this in their labs, the gel is, is um, the filler is a gel. So it's like a big glob of gel. And they take something called a rheometer, um, which is a machine with two titanic plates. And they place that gel between the two titanic plates and they apply centripetal force and with a little bit of, of side to side shaking as well. And um, they measure how much force it takes to mess up the product. So if they apply a lot of pressure and, um, the, and only then it kind of gets messed up, then it's a high G prime product. Mm -hmm. But if they only apply a little bit of force on it and it gets all messed up, that's a low G prime product. Okay. So something with a high G prime can withstand more force, stays where you put it. Low G prime, it's a little easier to mess around with, with just a little bit of force. That's great. And it's a really good explanation of it. I didn't, okay, I've good. never heard it uh, uh, that way. So it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a good framing of and the then, concept. And then just while we're on the topic, um, measuring flexibility and x strain, they do it the same the same way. So they take the same rheometer and instead of really um, measuring more of the force, it's more the twisting capability. So you see the rheometer twisting around and around. So they see how far and how much they can twist it um, till it kind of breaks and messes it up. Great. Okay. Fantastic. So that, that gives us a um, uh, better idea of how they rate these products and how we can apply them. Right. Okay. Fantastic. And there's a lot of stuff you could probably talk a lot about <laughs> uh, product selection. Uh, so there's a lot of variability there. there but is. let's now let's turn our attention to pitfalls because there's a lot of them with filler just because the nature of... That's a whole of, lecture. Right. <laughs> and, um, but let's, let's talk specifically about um, arterial occlusion. Okay. Well, you know, let's, let's, let's talk about how you fix a mistake. Okay. Because okay. I think it's a little bit broader. Okay. So uh, how do you... When you run into trouble, they can be serious ones like mm -hmm. um, arterial occlusion, mm -hmm. or they can be like, oh, I don't like the way that looks right. uh, where I put that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so talk about correction. Okay, so as long as it's a hyaluronic acid filler, then we have Hylanex, which is hyaluronidase, which is an enzyme that breaks up hyaluronic acid to correct and undo and immediately dissolve what we, what we don't like, or in an emergency, what we need to get rid of immediately. So um, having that in our back pocket uh, very often makes people feel a little bit more comfortable using hyaluronic acid products to have that as an extra safety. Yeah. Right. So the, the idea is don't ever stick hyaluronic in someone's face unless you've got a bottle of that or more. Oh, absolutely. A, yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. And even as a trainer, because I train for Allergan and Galderma, the first thing I ask when I walk into a training and I, I ask to see their hyaluronidase. Right. And if that site doesn't have it there, I leave. You're out. I right. leave. Okay. There's no way we're injecting. It. Fair. Totally fair. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about Hylonex and, mm -hmm. you know, um, hyaluronidases. So, um, where uh, this is difficult because there's there's not a lot in medical literature about how you actually are supposed yeah. to do this and mm -hmm. i know this because i've i've researched the subject myself and there's not there's very small um there's some papers small papers yeah and they're in yeah. there um a lot of they differ a lot and they talk about different product other than hyalinex so it's not necessarily a clean line to mm -hmm. understanding so tell us what you do with hyalinex how you get it etc Okay, I believe we order it from McKesson, mm -hmm. um, I think. Uh, Miami so does do all we, my ordering, so, do so we. I think we, it's we get it from McKesson. Yeah, yeah. Um, so order it from there. I like to have several vials of it yeah. um, constantly available. So I used to have at all times, you know, eight vials. Now I try to have 12. And I think that also really depends on your location. So I have injector friends that are in very remote locations where they don't have a colleague that they can call within a mile radius and a moment's notice. So they'll have 50 vials mm -hmm. of right. Hylonex at all times ready to go in their refrigerators. Another thing to remember is that they do expire. So right. when you're doing your inventory and checking all the expiration dates, you need to ch check and, that expiration date on the, those. And the expiration dates are kind of short. And They're, it's an expensive yeah. product to have too. It doesn't, it doesn't have a long shelf life. Yeah. And that, that, sometimes that's tricky because people 
get a little lackadaisical about having it updated and on their shelf. Exactly. But there's a short life, uh, shelf life on those, exactly. those bottles. I oh. think it's worth that investment. If, God forbid, you ever need it in, in, in an emergency, you want to have it there. Okay. And then um, how do you use it? Constitution, um, how much are you using? Yeah. I know that there's really loose, informal, right. informal guidelines here. Yeah. So what do you do? So when it comes to uh, vascular compromise or a question of vascular occlusion, I don't think there's a limit. I think right. you just kind of keep flushing that area until you get relief. Right. Um, you know, I'll have patients where I'll do, you know, um, several cc, like one or two cc's, and then I will have them wait like a couple hours in the office, see how they're doing, and if I need to, I'll inject some more. Um, we don't want to overdo it either because there is some issues of, um, you know, allergic reactions, mm -hmm. anaphylaxis to it. I usually ask my patients if, I mean, it's a small, small percentage, but if I'm using a ton of it, you know, the more you use of something, the more you right. get worried, right? Um, but uh, <clears throat> I always ask my patients if they have any history of um, allergies to bee stings or wasps, because there is some evidence that that might have some sort of cross um, hypersensitivity to it. Uh, but, you know, in an emergency, you're, you're using it. You right. know, uh, yeah. but it's that's more of a question when you're using it just to like undo something that aesthetically wasn't pleasing or improper placed um, mm -hmm. filler. Um, in that case, I usually start with about a CC, okay. um, specifically if we're talking about lips, mm -hmm. um, but um, I, I mix it. Um, so I put about, generally, I'll put about um, 0.4 of Hylinex and then add another 0.6 of a mixture of lidocaine, bicarb, and bacteriostatic saline. So, okay. um, and evenly 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2. Got to it. get me that CC. Um, if I'm doing like a full, just I wanna just dissolve everything in that lip, that's usually what I start with. Bring them back in two weeks, and then see if I wanna do a little bit more, if it needs a little bit more, and then decide if on that visit, if they're able to then graduate to be re-injected, or if I need to um, dissolve um, ad um, additionally. So just like with our neurotoxins, the more you add in terms of saline, lido, you know, those solution, the more s spreadability you have, the more diffusion. So you need to kind of assess the patient and decide like how much do I want this to spread? Am I doing, am I just dissolving an entire cheek or is this one little tiny nodule that I feel in their lip that I just wanna go in, get into that, into that nodule and, and just dissolve that one little spot. In that case, I might just use straight straight Hylinex, put it in a little BD needle, make sure I get um, get through that um, capsule, and and just put a little bit there. So okay, it kind of just depends on what I'm treating, what I'm what I'm trying to achieve, um, and how big of an area am I treating. Got so, it. Yeah. And so just to um, wrap up that idea mm -hmm. of your uh, your concentration or constitution for arterial occlusion. So again, I want some. I want it because you know you're not going necessarily unless you have ultrasound guidance. Right, because you're you not sure. You don't know where it is. Yeah, yeah, you you want a little bit of that spreadability. And I've heard differing opinions. Um, there's some that like to use a little bit of lidocaine, so it doesn't hurt as much because it, it is. It's very. They're in pain, you know, Already. as it is. Yeah. But um, it's really interesting, my previous supervising physician, she actually um, didn't like using lidocaine because she's like, I want that sense of relief. I, you know, the moment, you know, the patient says, oh, that feels so much better, I know I got it. Right. So I don't want to use right. lidocaine. That, that makes but, sense. Um, but I'm usually doing something similar. Sometimes I'll do like a one-to-one, -one, so 0 0.5 of Hylonex and then 0 0.5 of saline. Great. Um, just so, because I want that spreadability. Right. And I want it to, to try to, in that emergency case, just get everywhere that it could be. Right. Yeah. And uh, so along the lines of uh, arterial occlusion, mm -hmm. any uh, bullets or tips on how to evaluate it, uh, rather how to avoid it. How to avoid it, yeah. yeah. So that's 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 a good one, that's a really hard one. I mean, um, you've quoted me before, I always say like, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. I think the future, honestly, to answer this question honestly, I think the future is gonna be ultrasound guidance, mm -hmm. um, just mapping out facial patients. The, right. the struggle with that is it's gonna take time, mm -hmm. right, to sit there and map out everyone's um, arterial blood supply before right. we're injecting them. So some people argue that it's just not realistic. Mm -hmm. But I think in certain areas of concern and high risk areas, like let's say if you're gonna be doing um, temples 
or you want to inject, I don't inject in glabella, but if you want to do it in a glabella or a nose, yeah. um, piriform aperture, I think those are areas that I think would be a very good idea to have ultrasound guidance, see what's going on there, make sure that you're not injecting. That's going to be probably the best um, tool that we have if you want to really do everything you can to avoid it. Um, is that saying that even under ultrasound guidance it's not possible? I'm not saying that. It can happen even because, you know, you're moving just a little bit. I mean, nothing's 100%. I think aspiration is also um, a, a good tool. Knowing your depths um, as well, knowing where the vessels are in that area, not just in location, but again in depth, so you know if you should be sub-Q in one area, if you should be super periosteal in another. That's really important, and that feeds into knowing your anatomy. Uh, but going back to aspiration, there's also a lot of controversy. You'll hear a lot of, um, you know, surgeons and even, even some derms will say like, oh, no, don't aspirate. Um, and some people will say absolutely aspirate. Personally, I'm an aspirator. Mm -hmm. I think like why not, sure. right? right? But um, they'll have arguments for both. Right. Um, right. So it kind of just depends. Yeah. But I these are different. I think, but I think, you know, the future of aesthetics, I think I'll probably be here in a couple of years and we'll be doing ultrasound courses yeah. at SDPA and cool. teaching people how to use ultrasound for injecting. Yeah, yeah I think it, it's, it's hazardous because there's no easy way to do it in, uh, no. to, to evaluate for it. But you, it's really, uh, you, like aspiration, I've seen, um, I've seen demonstrations where aspirating will not necessarily, even if you're intravascular, will not necessarily draw exactly. blood because of the, the, turg or the pressure, the negative right. pressure. And the stickiness of the filler, especially right. with those stickier yep. fillers that we have on the market. Right. You know, that's why primed needle, unprimed yeah. needle. Right. I mean, there's a lot, um, like, but nothing's yeah. nothing's 100%. So I just think if you do everything, yeah. um, that'll be your well, best chance. to your point, why not? Why not? Right? And it just takes you a second to do it. And I think, if anything, it's a nod to the fact that you have to understand anatomy. Absolutely. You, know, you can't be sticking needles in there that you don't know what's going on. Know your anatomy. Right. Absolutely. Dr. Um, uh, Surik always says, the fear of injecting is the fear of anatomy. Right. You know. That's so. That's I hope I quoted you right, Dr. Surik, yeah, but I think that's it. <laughs> that's a good, it's a good way, to, good way to put it. Yeah. Well, this is cool. All, yeah. you know, very practical stuff for our, for our injectors and people thinking about injecting to sort of, uh, you know, place, uh, put some information there to know what to investigate, know what to um, have in your armament when you're going to uh, inject these folks with their cosmetics. Yeah, I hope so. I was helpful, guys. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so do you want to um, tell us where to find you on social? Yeah, so if you have any questions, love for you guys to follow me at Lip Lady of Miami. Feel free to send me DMs with anything that wasn't clear here or some additional questions. I'm happy to help, help you guys out. Awesome. All right, you heard it from Ely Samuels here in Miami, Florida. Thanks for watching. Rob Kiske or at Dermcast TV. Thanks for having me.